The scripture reading for today comes from Jude, the first chapter, verses 5 through 16. Now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved a people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels, who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. Yet in like manner, these people also, relying on their dreams, defile the flesh, reject authority, and blaspheme the glorious ones. But when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you. But these people blaspheme all that they do not understand, and they are destroyed by all that they, like, that they, like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. Woe to them, for they walked in the way of Cain and abandoned themselves for the sake of gain, to Balaam's heir, and perished in Korah's rebellion. rebellion. These are hidden reefs at your love feast, as they feast with you without fear, shepherds feeding themselves, waterless clouds swept along by winds, fruitless trees in late autumn, twice dead, uprooted, wild waves of the sea, casting up the foam of their own shame, wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. It was also about these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on all, and to convict all the ungodly of all their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are grumblers, malcontents, following their own sinful desires. They are loudmouth boasters, showing favoritism to gain advantage. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. If y'all join your hearts and minds with me in prayer. Lord God, we give you thanks for your word. And even these words that can strike us as perhaps harsh and tough to hear. God, we know you've written them for a reason. And that you've written them for our good. Because you love us and you care for us and you seek to protect us. And so, God, may we hear from your word this morning. And, God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Uh, friends, you can grab a seat if you would. So, you know, normally when I start a sermon, like my first lines pretty, pretty consistently are, very excited to share God's word with you today. I don't know if you caught that text. It's, uh, it's a spicy boy, right? Uh, it's, a, it's a spicy one. Uh, but it is, it is a necessary text, and, and it's in there to, to help us, to warn us, to guide us. And so in that sense, I am excited uh, to share God's word with you today. Uh, so, so I often tell people who, who ask that uh, much, of how, much of how God called me into ministry uh, was through questions through asking questions. Uh, there were things about the faith that I inherited. I grew up in the church. Things about the faith I inherited uh, that I either didn't understand or struggled with or, or had problems with or objections to. Uh, and so I, I'd raise questions and I'd raise objections and I'd raise up my doubts and I'd talk with people and I'd talk with I'd just wonderful spiritual mentors that, that invested in me and were patient with me and poured wisdom into me. Uh, and helped me along my way. And in addition to, to those people, uh, I, I started to read and listen to a lot of, of what's called Christian apologetics. There's a lot of that. Uh, and I was particularly drawn to, to one thinker, uh, a guy named Ravi Zacharias. 
Uh, I found his ability to articulate the faith over and against the critics of Christianity uh, in a way that was winsome and thoughtful, was, was very inspiring to me. Uh, he, he, in fact, is a big part of the reason I, I study philosophy now, but I saw how he, he used that in service to the gospel. Uh, and, and I bought and read several of his books. Uh, I listened to his radio show back in the day because I'm old. Uh, and then I, I eventually listened to his podcast because I'm young, so it's what it is to be in your mid-30s. At any rate, uh, the, and in fact, the, the last thing I did before I left my, my church in Texas five years ago was I coordinated an event between my church there and, and his ministry. Uh, and then he died in May of 2020. And, and when he died, I, I genuinely, I shed some tears over it. I put a tribute to him uh, up on all my socials. And then, several weeks after his death, several women stepped forward and accused him of sexual and spiritual abuse. And so his organization hired an outside firm to investigate these claims, and it took uh, a few months. Uh, but the day the report came out, uh, I read it right away, uh, and it was worse than I could have imagined. Uh, the things he did were, were some of the most horrific things I can imagine someone in his position to do. Uh, so much so that I don't really want to share what they were uh, up front. But as I read through this report, I was just initially just gutted and just crushed for these women and, and what they had gone through and the ways he had hurt them. And then after being crushed, I, I shifted and I was just angry. And I, and I was angry at myself for, for not seeing him for who he really was. And I was angry on behalf of the people he misled. And I was angry for the people he abused. And I was angry that I knew there were people who would leave the faith and never look back. Because he was a false teacher who abused his office. And see, friends, this is where we're at in the book of Jude. That you were, if you were with us last week in the introduction, uh, Jude tells his audience, this church he's writing to, that he's writing to them because false teachers have crept into their church. And he wants to warn this church about them. He wants to warn them about these false teachers. And like, again, I don't know if you caught this in the reading, but... But Jude is angry about this. Like, like he pulls no punches. And so I'm just going to say on the front end here, that, that might be a little uncomfortable for us. Maybe as Justin was reading it, you're like, oh boy. It might be a little uncomfortable for us because we like to think of church as this sort of joyous place where we come together. And on the one hand, of course, it should be. Like we're, we're people of joy. We, we know who God is and he loves us, right? Generally speaking, that's good. But what Jude reminds us here in this text is the reality that, that it's, it's not all fun and games. It's not all fun and games. Uh, scholars D.A. Carson and Douglas Moo put it like this. People do not like to dwell on the negative. That may be one reason why Jude is such a neglected letter. But we need to hear the negative. We need to understand that false teachers exist. That their teaching can be both attractive and dangerous. And that their condemnation is certain. And so what Jude is going to do in our text today is going to tell us the what and the why of false teachers. He's going to tell us the danger of their false teaching. Uh, and then I'm going to close this out with the gospel. It's not really in the text, but I was like, we're going to need it after this one, all right? So, so we're going to look at the, the what and the why of these false teachers. We're going to look at the danger of their false teachings. And then we're just going to marvel at the beauty of the gospel, all right? So that's our outline today. And so let's get into it. And I do, again, one more forewarning for this message uh, is initially... Uh, this sermon is going to feel much more like a Bible study uh, than a sermon. Uh, like, I, you know, I don't have like a ton of stories. I only have one quote, if you can believe it. And it's very short and it's at the end. It's wild. Uh, at any rate, uh, but you just like, he has so many references to the Old Testament in this that, that, that we just really need to unpack them uh, if we want to get what this text is saying. All right. So 1130, hang with me. All right. Because I think it's worth it. All right. But just there's going to be part way through. You're going to be like, is he still going? Like, come on. All right. Just hang with me. You guys can do it. Uh, so let's get into it. So what Jude does is he compares uh, the false teachers that have snuck into this church. He compares them uh, to three groups of people that were rebellious against God in the Old Testament. Then he explains why they do all this, why the false teachers are the way they are. Uh, and then he compares them to three individuals who were rebellious against God in the Old Testament. Three groups, why three individuals. Let's look at the first of the groups. Look with me at verse 5. It says this, Now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus who saved the people out of the land of Egypt afterward destroyed those who did not believe. 
All right, so here Jude references uh, the story of the Exodus. It's the, the central story of the Old Testament. This is when God delivered his people, the people of Israel, Israel from slavery in Egypt. But you notice, uh, who does Jude say delivered the people out of slavery in Egypt? He says Jesus does, that Jesus does. Now, this is fascinating uh, because many scholars believe that Jude was written about 50 AD. It's actually one of the, the earliest written uh, documents in the New Testament. Uh, so very soon after Jesus' earthly ministry. And yet Jude here reflects what, what in theology we call a, a high Christology. And what this means is that from the very beginning, the first Christians saw Jesus as one with the God of the Old Testament. That he's one with the God who rescued Israel from slavery. And yet, uh, as the story of the Exodus goes on, Numbers 14, Israel is, is saved from slavery. They wander through the wilderness for a minute, and then they get right on the edge of the land that God has promised to give them. They're right on the edge of the land that God has promised to give them. And they say, all right, let's scope out the land. And so they send 12 spies into the land to scope it out. The 12 spies come back, and 10 of those spies say, hey, we cannot go in there. I don't care what God said. The people in there are big and scary, not the land for us. And the people listen to these spies, and they say, uh, we're, we're not going to enter the land that God promised us. And so God says, fine, very well, have it your way. And he has them wander in the wilderness for another 40 years until this generation that refused to trust in God's promises dies off. And so what Jude is saying is here is he's saying, these false teachers in your church, he's saying they're leading you to doubt God's promises, just like the people of Israel did. That's the first group. Second group, verse 6. And the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. Now, there's a bit of a debate about this verse uh, as to who his references here. Uh, it could be that he's referencing uh, Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14, which tells about the original rebellion of, of Satan and the other fallen angels against God before the world began. That could be what he's referencing here. Uh, or it could be a reference to, to what are called the, the Nephilim. Uh, does anyone know about the Nephilim? If you've ever like tried to read the Bible in a year, you'll get six days in, Genesis 6, and you'll be like, what is this? Uh, and so the, the Nephilim are, are these angels who, who left the spiritual realm, entered into our world, and, and started sleeping with human women. Uh, and so there's this whole rabbinic tradition uh, that, that explains how God punished these angels for leaving their appropriate roles. Now, whether it's the original rebellion of Satan and his demons or the Nephilim is, is actually not super important for us today. Because the bottom line is this, what Jude wants us to see is that these angels rebelled against God by not staying in the roles that God assigned to them. And so Jude is saying these false teachers are like that. These false teachers are acting out of turn. They're claiming to have an authority and a role in your life that they do not actually have. Final group he references, verse 7. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. All right, so uh, this is a reference to Genesis 19, uh, where God sends two angels uh, to destroy the city of Sodom. And when these angels show up, uh, they stay at Abraham's nephew's house. His name is Lot. Uh, and the angels go into Lot's house, and the men of the city uh, show, uh, go to, to Lot's house, and they knock on the door, and they say, hey, Lot, uh, we, we see that, that you have some guests in there. Uh, would you send those guys out uh, so that we can rape them? That the, the sexual immorality of the city was so bad that they simply viewed new people in their city as an opportunity for sexual exploitation. It's very clear in Scripture. God's design for human sexuality is very clear. It's that any sexual activity is reserved exclusively for the covenant bonds of marriage between a husband and a wife. Anything that falls outside of that is sexual morality, is sin. And so Jude is saying these false teachers are practicing sexual morality and trying to convince you that you can just ignore God's design for human sexuality. And he says, look where that leads. Ultimately, to death and destruction. So three groups. Jude says, just like the Israelites doubted God's promises, these false teachers are leading you to doubt God's promises. Just like the angels didn't stay in their roles, these false teachers are acting out of turn. And just like Sodom and Gomorrah disregarded God's design for sexuality, these false teachers are practicing and leading you into sexual morality. 
So before Jude goes on to compare these false teachers to three individuals from the Old Testament, he explains the root cause behind their problem. Like, why are these false teachers this way? Like, why are they doing what they're doing? Look with me at verse 8. He says, Yet in like manner, these people also, relying on their dreams, defile the flesh, reject authority, and blaspheme the glorious ones. And so here Jude lays out the core problem of these false teachers. He says they rely on their dreams, they defile the flesh, they reject authority, and they blaspheme the glorious ones. Now, we could break down what each one of those things mean, but the bottom line is they're all making the same point, and that's this. The problem of these false teachers, the fundamental problem of these false teachers, is that they reject God's authority over their lives, and they place themselves above God. That's their fundamental problem. All their false teaching, all the bad practice that they're doing flows from the fact that they reject God's authority over their lives and they place themselves above God. And so Jude then gives an example of this from the rabbinic tradition. Uh, Jude 1 verse 9, he says, But when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, The Lord rebuke you. Uh, now, again, this story is, is actually not in the Bible. It's, it's from the rabbinic tradition, but, but in it, it's kind of an interesting story to, to read. Uh, the devil tries to convince the archangel Michael that, that Moses' body belongs to him. Uh, and the devil's line of argument for that is he says, hey, uh, listen, God can be in control of the spiritual realm, the immaterial, but I'm in control of the material world, so his body belongs to me. And he says, also, Moses was a murderer, so he belongs to me. And the archangel Michael hears this, and he's like, uh-uh. He says, the, the Lord rebuke you. He says, no, no, no. God is ruler over all things, both material and immaterial. He's the creator, and he gets to decide what happens to Moses so you can get lost. And so Jude's point is that the devil refused to submit to God's authority, but Michael uses God's authority to tell him to back off. And Jude then says, but these false teachers are not like Michael. Instead, they're like this, verse 10. These people blaspheme all that they do not understand, and they are destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. And so rather, he says, rather than learn how to live as God has called us and submit to his authority, he says these false teachers are just driven by their instincts. They let their primal urges and their most base desires drive their actions and their lives. And in doing so, they behave like animals. And then Jude says, this is just like three individuals in the Old Testament. Verse 11. He says, woe to them, for they walked in the way of Cain and abandoned themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's error and perished in Korah's rebellion. And so the first individual from the Old Testament that Jude brings up here is Cain. Uh, we learn about Cain in Genesis chapter 4. He's the son of Adam and Eve, brother to Abel. Uh, and when his brother Abel, when Cain's brother Abel offers a better sacrifice to God, uh, Cain gets so jealous and so angry that he murders his brother. And so Jude's saying, just like Cain, these false teachers care only about themselves, only about their glory, even to the detriment of others. And then Jude says these false teachers are like Balaam. Balaam was a prophet in Israel, Numbers 22 to 24, and he actually started off as a pretty good prophet. But he turned into a false prophet who abused his position for financial and positional gain. That he'd go around and tell people things they wanted to hear so that he could increase his platform and increase his pocketbook. Jude says these false teachers are like that. They tell you what you want to hear for the sake of boosting their own status. And then the final individual Jude highlights is Korah. Uh, Korah is a guy who, in number 16, refused to accept God's leadership uh, given to him through Moses and Aaron. And he led a rebellion against Moses and Aaron uh, that actually resulted in the earth opening up and Korah and his whole crew getting swallowed into the earth. A wild story. And so Jude says, just like Korah, these false teachers rebel and reject against the authority that God has placed over them. Whew. How are you doing, 1130? Good? We're hanging in there? Bart's excited. Thank you, one of you. Uh, you did it. All right, that's the hardest part. We made it through. Let's recap, though. It's important. It's good pedagogy. All right, so let's recap. Uh, Jude says the false teachers, this is how they function. False teachers lead people to doubt God's promises. 
Two, they claim a role that isn't theirs. Three, they encourage and practice sexual morality. Four, are selfish to the detriment of others. Five, use their roles to boost their own platforms and pocketbooks. Six, are rebellious against those that God has placed over them. If you can click back to the first slide of this. Now, friends, as we look at this list, I wonder, do we see any false teachers in the church today? And we're like, yes, I have the internet, right? Yeah, absolutely we do. We absolutely do. And so we're going to walk through these, all right? So let's look at number one. False teachers lead people to doubt God's promises. I've heard numerous teachers claim that you shouldn't be sure of your salvation. As if the promises of God in Christ Jesus given to you at your baptism aren't enough. As if God can't keep his word, but you've got to work and work and work to be sure that you stay in his good graces. That's leading you to doubt God's promises. And it's a lie. God's promises to you in Christ are forever. He doesn't go back on his word. You can be sure of your salvation in Christ. Number two, false teachers claim a role that isn't theirs. These are church leaders who practice spiritual abuse by being overly controlling and manipulative of the lives of the people they're called to lead and to serve. I've heard horror stories of supposed pastors telling people that if they move to another city or if they take this job or if they get out of this abusive relationship that they'll be, quote, under the judgment of God. That's unbiblical. That's ungodly. That's not their role. Look at number three. False teachers encourage and practice sexual immorality. These are false teachers who say, ah, yes, ah, yes, I understand that for the first 2,000 years of Christianity, they taught that this is the sexual ethic shown in the Bible that's reserved for the covenant bonds of marriage between a husband and a wife. But come on. That's so oppressive and so backwards and so unenlightened. Uh, Scriptures doesn't understand things like we do now, so let me do a bunch of theological gymnastics so we can ignore the parts of Scripture we don't like, so we're not chained down by those archaic notions. You just do whatever you want sexually. There's no consequences. Number four, false teachers are selfish to the detriment of others. There's a million ways this one plays out. Uh, but I would argue we see this just most plainly in what's called the prosperity gospel. All right, these are, are preachers who say, hey, if you pray hard enough, if you believe strong enough, and most importantly, if you give me your money, God will make you healthy, wealthy, and wise. And if he doesn't do that, don't bother talking to me about it because I'm going to fly away on the private jet that you just bought me. All right? Number five. They use roles to boost their platforms. They use their role to boost their own platforms and pocketbooks. These are false teachers who compromise clear teaching in Scripture for the sake of cozying up to elites and growing their platforms. Preachers that don't talk about sin, that use the Bible primarily as a self-help book, or those that ignore clear teaching in Scripture for the sake of political or social gain. Uh, There's nothing wrong, of course, with being involved in politics, but we see in Christians on both the left and the right that they ignore sin for the sake of power in politics and clout in their tribe. Number six, false teachers are rebellious against those that God has placed over them. We've seen this. There are leaders in the church who are rightly called to repentance over a sin they've committed. And instead of repenting and submitting to the authority of the word of God and learning from men and women who are more spiritually mature than they are, they say, oh, no one can tell me what to do. You guys don't have the right to tell me. You're just being judgmental. You're just being legalistic. And so what Jude is doing here is he's telling this church and he's telling us, he's saying, you got to be on the lookout for this stuff. Like, it exists. It's real. He says, these are wolves in sheep's clothing. He says that actually in much more poetic language. Listen to verses 12 and 13. Talking about these false teachers. He says, these are hidden reefs at your love fests as they feast with you without fear. Shepherds feeding themselves, waterless clouds swept along by winds, fruitless trees in late autumn twice dead, uprooted, wild waves of the sea casting up the foam of their own shame, wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. Like It's poetic, but Jude just drops the hammer here. He just lets it fall. And see, and here's why. Here's why. See, here's the deal. I like to think of the gospel as a diamond, okay? And the cool thing about diamonds, 
uh, is, you know, however you want to look at it, you can see different facets of it, right? The different ways you look at it, you see these different facets. So, so if we think of the gospel as I'm going to be like, oh my gosh, uh, in Christ, I'm invited in the family of God and I'm loved and accepted as a son or as a daughter. Be like, oh, in Christ, I'm, I'm justified. It's just as if I've never sinned. I'm innocent and holy and blameless. Oh, in Christ, I'm reconciled to God. He calls me to be his own. Right? There's all these different ways we can look at the gospel as this beautiful diamond. But what happens is as the gospel moves throughout the world, uh, we might think of it as a diamond rolling down a hill. And inevitably, as this diamond rolls down the hill, some muck and some mud are going to get stuck onto it. It's just going to happen. And that's what these false teachers and their false teachings are. But then what can happen pretty soon is enough muck and enough mud gets on and we can't see the diamond because it's just covered in the mud. And so then instead of looking at the beauty of the diamond, we're just holding a ball of mud in our hands. And a ball of mud is useless. It's only good to be thrown out. And that's what Jude says is the result of these false teachers. Last three verses. It was also about these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of all their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way. And of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are grumblers, malcontents, following their own sinful desires. They are loud mouth boasters, showing favoritism to gain advantage. Uh, now, we don't have time to go into that bit about Enoch that this started off with. I just feel like we've covered enough Old Testament today. Is that okay? 1130? Okay. Uh, but it's fine because I think Jude's very clear in these final three verses. It's not hard to understand. We may not like it, but it's not hard to understand. He's saying false teaching leads to judgment and condemnation. That's the point. False teaching leads to judgment and condemnation in this life and in the next. And so friends, pl please understand this today. Uh, many of you know, if you've been around here at all, like my natural disposition, my natural preaching style is not this, right? Like it's just not. Like, I'm typically a little bit more silly, a little bit irreverent, uh, a bit self-deprecating, all right? Uh, but, but I want you to know, I, I do that uh, because I don't ever want to take myself too seriously that I start puffing myself up. But at the same time, I want you to understand, I do take this position, the office of pastor and teacher in the church, very seriously. Now, because this isn't a game. That Jude tells us when it comes to teaching the things of God, we are quite literally playing with fire. And so friends, let me say this. If you find yourself sucked into any sort of the false teaching we just laid out, run. Run from it. And friends, if, if you find yourself caught in a sin that one of these false teachers says, hey, it's fine, it's no big deal, or you've decided it's fine, it's no big deal, let me tell you, run. Run from that. Or if you've got people in your life that are deceived by these things, it's okay to lovingly, humbly, and graciously invite them to run. Or my goodness, if you ever find that, that Pastor Marcus or myself are teaching things or doing things that, don't typ or that typify what false teachers teach and do, you better run. Tell our elders to call us out. Run to one of us. Call us out. I'll give you our district president's email. You can tell him. It's fine. Because the reality is, the gospel is a precious gift. The gospel is a diamond of immeasurable worth. And anything or anyone that covers it with mud, we got to wipe the mud away. And see, here's the deal. We, we look at the harshness of Jude's words here. And we, and we think about God's judgment and condemnation. And, and if you're like me, oftentimes I think about that and I just sort of recoil inside. And I want to say, listen, like, like I believe in a God of love. God is love. I believe in this God of judgment. But friends, it's precisely because God is love that God judges. It's precisely because God is love that he must judge. Because here's the deal, if someone hurts or harms one of my kids, it is not loving for me to allow that to continue. It's profoundly unloving. It's not loving for me to not stop that person. 
for either my kids or for them. And it's the same thing with God. It's precisely because he loves his people that he executes judgment against those who harm them. And yet the reality is that just like there are wolves in sheep's clothing inside the church, there's a wolf at work inside of each one of us, inside of each one of you. As Dostoevsky says, everyone is guilty with respect to everyone else for everything, and I more than anyone. But friends, the good news of the gospel is that Jesus promises to deal with wolves. Jesus takes care of wolves. He takes care of wolves. He deals with wolves that come from the outside in, and he deals with those wolves that come from the inside out. And he deals with wolves because he is the good shepherd. Listen to what he says in John 10. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And so friends, hear this. If, if you've ever been hurt or harmed or led into sin by false teachers, Jesus has not forgotten you. Jesus has not left you. He is the good shepherd. He knows you. Just as he knows the Father. And he laid down his life to protect you from the wolves. So you can cling to him alone. And for each one of us here, who've all got our own wolves inside. Jesus took those upon himself and he took them to the cross. And they died there. And so you don't fear judgment. You don't need to fear condemnation. Your good shepherd has provided for you and it is enough. He has conquered the lies, the evil, the sin, and the darkness inside each of us. So friends, may you cling to him alone. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are the good shepherd. That you laid down your life for us. To save us from the lies outside of us. And to rescue us from the wolves inside of each of us. So Jesus, we, we pray that we would look to you, that we would cling to you. That any muck or mud that has gotten in the way of seeing you and your gospel, we would wipe that away. And praise and thank you for your beauty and your goodness in saving us. It's in your holy name we pray. Amen. Uh, well, friends, uh, we have a practice here before we head to the Lord's table. We take time uh, to, to go before our God and confess our sins, uh, not to wallow in our guilt, but in anticipation of the forgiveness uh, he offers us in this meal. So I encourage you to take a minute to uh, examine your heart and go quietly before your Father in heaven.